Hey everyone, welcome to the HR McMillan Space Center. I'm Michael Unger, the coordin- uh, program coordinator. Uh, and with me as always, 2 p.m. on Thursday is our astronomer, uh, Rachel Wang. How's it going, Rachel? Good, I'm a little tired because I stayed up late last night. <laughs> oh, and what were you doing staying up late last night? <laughs> Looking at the Perseids on yeah. site too, nonetheless. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we had our, another one of our uh, physically distant uh, events here in person that we combined with a, uh, an online portion. Um, and it was really exciting because we actually kind of used um, the real planetarium, which is the sky. Uh, you and one of our interpreters, Aaron, were out there interpreting the sky and actually did get to see some of the meteors. Is that right? Yeah, we did. We saw uh, quite a few, actually. Yeah. Awesome. So, so we had the observatory open. There was planets to see. There was a whole bunch to see. And that is what our theme is for this week, of course. We're talking about the Perseids, which uh, are still ongoing. Is that correct, Rachel? Yeah, all the way to the end of August. Okay, so uh, if you're going out camping, so all the information uh, that you could, that if you were with us last night, uh, we're going to be delving into uh, this topic today for the next half hour. Rachel, we're going to give a short presentation about the Perseids. So if you have any questions about the Perseids, about meteor showers, and a little bit about comets, as we as we're going to find out, uh, are the result of or that the meteor shower is the result of comets, as we're going to find out. Uh, put it into chat of YouTube and also uh, hello to everyone out there uh, on Telus Optic. Uh, hope you can join us on YouTube if you want to ask questions in person. But uh, let's start off uh, with our little presentation about the Perseids and then we'll get into some questions and anything after that. Sure. So to get started here sharing my screen, hopefully you'll be able to see some cartoon meteor showers up on your screen. Cartoon meteor showers? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, there we go. Awesome. Okay, so I thought I would start off with a refresher about what a meteor is and what are all these terms that sound a lot like meteors but aren't quite the same thing. So we have a meteoroid, which is basically a big rocky object that orbits around the sun. And then if you have something that's a little bit bigger and actually ends up interacting with the Earth's atmosphere, it'll burn up, uh, give off a really brilliant flash of light, and it becomes a meteor, what we call colloquially a shooting star. And if you just so happen to survive that passage through the Earth's atmosphere, you survive that burning up, and you make it to the Earth's surface, then you become a meteorite. And I've also included the definitions for an asteroid and comet below, just in case you needed a little bit of a reminder. You know, Rachel, uh, when we first started, uh, when I first started working here, there was this uh, this joke that was written into one of our shows, which did this that exact thing, talking about the different mm-hmm. meteorites. Uh, but then there was a force definition, which was uh, if a meteor uh, hits your sibling, it's a meteor wrong. <laughs> I'm going to use that for sure from now on. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> um, okay, so where do meteors come from? So remember that comets are nothing but big chunks of dirty icy snowballs, essentially. And they orbit around the sun in elliptical orbits. And when they pass close to the sun, they begin to release gases in a process that we call outgassing. And the dust that they emit spreads out into a dusty tail around their orbits. And you see that over here in orange. And so every year our Earth passes through these debris trails, which allows these bits to collide with our atmosphere where they disintegrate and cause fiery and colorful streaks across the nighttime sky. Now to show you uh, this in a little bit more detail, I have meteorshowers.org open because it has this really cool 3D visualization of this debris flow and the orbits of our planets and our Earth going through that debris. So you can see all of this debris floating around, left behind by a comet on this really, really, really long, highly elliptical orbit. And it comes by every 133 years. So if you want to play around with that, I highly recommend it. It's quite fun. (laughs) I spent a good, decent amount of time on that website. Um, But the meters that we see, in particular for the Perseids, come from a comet called Comet Swift Puddle. And the comet's orbit is close enough for these particles to be swept up by Earth's gravitational pull each year. And when the comet comes back around to this part of the neighborhood, it replenishes that material, replenishes that debris. So we have uh, these Perseids annually every year. And it was Giovanni Schiaparelli who realized in 1865 that this comet was in fact the source of the Perseids. Now we get the Perseids annually, despite the comet having a 133 period long orbit, um, because the debris is also moving in an orbit as well. It's also orbiting around our sun. 
So it's almost like our Earth is passing through a conveyor belt of debris and passing through different parts of that debris each year. So Comet Swift Tuttle was discovered in 1862 independently by these two astronomers. And so like I mentioned, it orbits the sun every 133 years. And the last visit was back in 1992, which means its next visit uh, will be in 2125, so quite a while from now. So it is a large comet. Its nucleus or the center is around 26 kilometers across. So that's around two and a half times the size of the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs and is traveling four times as fast. But lucky for us, it's not on a collision course with Earth. And in fact, Comet Swift Tuttle's orbits have been calculated for the next 2000 years, just to be really sure. And of course, it almost goes without saying that what you're seeing here is not a true depiction of historical events, but I think and I hope that there is some comedic value here. <laughs> All right, so astronaut Ron Guerin on Expedition uh, 28 tweeted this image from the ISS. And I think this is really cool because I've circled here a Perseid meteor that he saw from the International Space Station. And he photographed this over China. And I think that is just a really cool, different view of the Perseid meteor shower. But not all of us can get up to the ISS like Ron did. So if I was on the surface of the Earth, where should I look? Well, the Perseids are named after the constellation Perseus. And so that tells us where on the sky to look because constellations help astronomers map out the sky so we know what direction. And so here I've marked or have marked the Perseid radiant. And so that this plus sign here is the point where it looks like all of these meteors are originating from. So that's not to say that the Perseus constellation is the source of the meteors, but rather just the direction that we expect to see all these meteors flying in all sorts of different directions away from this radiant or this point. And so here I have timeanddate.com or screenshots from timeanddate.com. I love this website because you can put in your location and see what the nighttime sky looks like, see constellations and the best time to view planets. And so to find and locate the Perseus constellation, you wanna look for the W constellation and that's Cassiopeia. And I circled it here on the left. And I talked a little bit before about how to locate Cassiopeia using the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. So that's a useful tool to help you orient yourself on the nighttime sky. But of course, things like planispheres or star finders or stargazing apps are also very useful as well. But you should be careful because they will ruin your dark adaptation. So make sure you do have a red light filter or maybe don't use your phone at all because nature is putting on a very spectacular show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Meteor showers are usually at their best after midnight during the pre-dawn hours, and here's why. So before sunrise, you're on the side of the Earth that's facing along its orbit. And Earth's orbital speed around the sun is around 30 kilometers per second. So bits of comet debris hit our atmosphere even faster because we're traveling in opposite directions and heading towards on a head-on collision with these, with these meteorites. And so that means that in these pre-dawn hours, these meteorites will be a little bit brighter when they burn up in our atmosphere because they have a little bit more speed, they have a little bit more energy. And so we wanna look in the pre-dawn hours for uh, extremely bright or brighter uh, meteor showers. And this is generally true for most meteor showers, but uh, for us last night, I don't think any of us wanted to stay up that late. So we ended up staying up from around 10 p.m. to a little bit past midnight and we're able to see plenty of meteors there. So now on a perfectly clear, perfectly dark night, you can expect up to 100 meteor showers at the peak. But the meteors themselves will be traveling at almost 60 kilometers per second. And the number of meteors that you see really depends on the severity of light pollution in your area. And Michael talked a little bit about light pollution last week. Now this year, the moon will be in its last and third quarter phase and close to the radiant. So moonlight will wash out a little bit of our skies. But the, the Perseids tend to be quite bright, so you might still see up to anywhere up to 40 to 50 meteors per hour, depending on how good your dark sky location or observing location is. Now, Perseids are known for their fireballs. Fireballs are just larger explosions of light and color that can last longer than an average meteor streak. And that's because fireballs originate from larger particles of cometary material. That also means that fireballs are brighter, with an apparent magnitude or brightness of greater than negative three. So that's brighter than Comet Neowise ever got. Now for every fireball that streaks out of Perseus, there will be dozens more of ordinary meteors. 
but you still want to get away from the light pollution of city lights because while fireballs can be seen from urban areas, the many more fainter Perseids are much more visible from dark sky locations. Okay, so lucky for us here in Canada, the Perseids are best viewed in the Northern Hemisphere during those pre-dawn hours. And, but it, uh, it is possible to see meteors uh, as early as 10 p.m. as we saw last night at the Space Center. Now you don't need any special skills or any special equipment to be able to view it. All you need is an eyeball or two and a dark sky location and making sure that you're dressing warmly, dressing appropriately for the weather and a little bit of patience. Now, even though tonight is the end of the peak nights, August 11th to August 13th, the Percy meteor shower stretches from July 17th to August 24th. So we still have roughly 10 days left in the meteor shower. So if you haven't gone out to look, I highly recommend getting outside and looking up and seeing if you can see some of these streaks of light. Alrighty. And awesome, Rachel. Here we go. So, you know, I've got a, a question just thinking about, you know, this comet is long gone. It's not going to be coming back again. And we are going through this conveyor belt, as you say. Mm -hmm. So is there ever a point when maybe we just run out of uh, meteors because we've uh, sucked them all up? Uh, not quite, because uh, the conveyor belt is moving that debris. So when we, by the time we come back around, it's a, a different section or a different debris that we're passing through. But what's cool about that is because the comet comes around and replenishes that material every 133 years, if you time uh, the time of year or the time that you're born at, that coincides with uh, when that comet comes around on its 133 year orbit, then you get to see um, a more prolific meteor shower. Okay. Um... Uh, already got some questions uh, coming in. Uh, Pride uh, wants to know if there were enough meteors falling from a comet tail, would it rain? Would it would it snow? So I guess uh, I guess what she's potentially talking about is uh, if we, there was like a really really close uh, encounter with a comet, like would we ha would we really get uh, some increased uh, meteors in our sky? Sure. So I am thinking that the thought process here is that comets are made of this icy material. So maybe if one flew by close enough it would just sprinkle a little bit of snow as it's going on by. And uh, the, the answer to this actually has to do with our atmosphere. So our atmosphere has a lot of stuff in it, a lot of atmospheric constituents. And when things interact with our atmosphere, they're passing by and they collide and lose energy um, as they're passing through the atmosphere. And for us, for uh, meteor showers, we see that as uh, flashes of light and heat, and that's where the energy is going. So if we did have a comet that, you know, scraped on by Earth, uh, anything that it dropped off or any debris that it left behind would be burnt up in our atmosphere. Yeah, interesting. And I guess it also, you know, really depends on the angle too that, that it's coming in on, because if it's coming in on sort of like a, a very sort of like low angle, it's probably going through more atmosphere. Now, are those the ones that really make the streak or is it ones that more of like hit our planet more head on? Uh, so that's a good question and a really good point to say that, uh, it, even though there is a radiant, there is this origin point that it looks like all these meteors are originating from, yeah. they do end up streaking in all sorts of different directions because that debris is hitting our atmosphere at different angles. So if you wanted the longest streak possible or something like a fireball, you would want something that's big enough to survive that passage and uh, burn for a lot longer than something small would when it passes through our atmosphere. And you'd want it to hit at a more oblique angle. So something that is uh, almost kind of parallel to the atmosphere. So it spends more time burning up in the atmosphere. So we get that longer streak. Right. And so you had uh, given us some definition. So a fireball is really, that's just sort of like a colloquial expression for what it looks like across the sky, but it's still a meteor, right? Yeah, it's just a particularly bright meteor. Uh, so if it is a particular bright meteor, it must be larger or or hitting at a particular angle. So, or would you, so would you define the fireball as being a larger ones or just ones that are hitting at that certain angle? Cause we do have a question from Mike, uh, about that, you know, sort of like how big would those ones be? But now I'm thinking maybe it's not so much size maybe it's more angle. Uh, it's kind of a combination, uh, I would attribute some of that to size for sure, because it has to survive that passage through our atmosphere. So when you see those really short, um, short lived streaks of light, those are um, very small particles that are passing through our atmosphere. And so they're short lived. But if you wanted something that was a little bit more brighter then you would need something that can survive that journey through our atmosphere and can burn for a decent while. 
Yeah. And of course, we get meteors hitting our Earth every day, is it right? And, um, you know, there's a really good website uh, because every once in a while uh, during a slow, a slow news day, uh, we'll get reports, we'll get calls, and you're probably getting calls too of people seeing things in the sky. But there actually is a website that uh, I go to a lot. I don't know if you go to as well, which is um, basically a comet watch and or meteor watches. There's a bunch of them. It's basically just sort of like um, citizens reporting on things that they see in the sky. And if a bunch of people are all seeing the same things, um, then that's a pretty good chance that there was a, a comet up there. I'll have to try to see if there's a bunch of them. There's a few different ones that are basically just sort of like, they're just logs mm -hmm. um, that, people, that people find. And those are the ones that are probably more intriguing in the off meteor shower times when sort of like, oh, that was a surprise. That was a really big one. Kind of like the one that uh, hit uh, Chelyabinsk uh, in Russia um, yeah. a few months ago. Yeah. That's a question that I commonly get is, uh, you know, if we're passing through all this debris, is something going to hit our earth and, you know, wipe out right. our planet? And, you know, the answer to that is NASA is doing a fantastic job of tracking all these objects and also citizen scientists as well. And so the Jet Propulsion Laboratory has something called a sentry system that can track the orbits of things like asteroids, big chunks of rock in outer space, and calculate the trajectories. And so they do something similar to what the ISS does as it orbits our Earth and in avoiding things like space debris or space junk that is in low Earth orbit. And mm -hmm. so they're able to track and see if they're on a collision course with some object and they use thrusters on the ISS to alter the trajectory a little bit. And we can do the same kind of thing with asteroids that are on a collision course with us and kind of push them and nudge them in a slightly different direction, hopefully around our Earth and away. But the chances of that happening are very, very slim. Yeah, that brings up an interesting uh, point. And uh, Harry has a very basic question, which is how, when did meteors form? But now um, we can kind of like expand that question and think about, well, do, do these little pieces of uh, space debris, things that we have put up into space, re-entering our atmosphere, would those also constitute as meteors as well? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question, and I'm going to answer that by telling you a story about how the ISS astronauts get rid of their poop, and that's they <laughs> throw it into the atmosphere and it burns up. So there is always a chance when you look up in the sky and you think you're seeing a shooting star, you're actually seeing a streaking thing of poop flying across uh, the atmosphere. So there is a chance of that. Um, but I want to talk about so where these meteors come from. Um, it has to also do with the fact that comets are these leftover remnants from the formation of our solar system. And that's actually kind of really cool to think about that um, these are, you know, from four and a half billion years ago, but I digress. So these comets and things like asteroids in our asteroid belt are leftover pieces from our formation of our solar system that didn't go into making things like planets and moons. They just didn't clump together and now are fleet floating in orbit around our sun. So every time you see a comet, you're looking, you're almost looking back in time. Yeah, so cool. And of course, yeah, I was thinking about that we saw the comet uh um from last month uh let's go on to nico who has a question do non-exploding meteors make a sound when they burn up and if yes has it ever been recorded Ooh, that's a really good question so who i have to think about this i'm thinking that something would have to try travel very, very quickly to hear something like when you're in a fast traveling spacecraft and there's a sonic boom. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be quite loud and you have to be traveling very, very quickly. So I, these meteors, although they're traveling quite fast, they're not quite at that speed that you would get something um, that drastic or that, that loud. Um, whether or not they give off any sort of sound, I think that, you know, there is some sort of I guess maybe a crackling or as this meteor is burning up in our atmosphere, there's some sort of sound there as you would expect when you burn a campfire, there's crackling there as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone has recorded it yet, but that would be pretty interesting to hear the sounds of a meteor shower. Yeah, for sure. Um, but of course, if, when, we're, when you talk about really large ones, and if we are going to create, if there is one large enough to create a sonic boom, those are actually the ones that would create the damage and is probably more. Uh, so I think the Chelyabinsk one, um, the very large fireball that uh, entered over over Russia, it was the sonic boom that created created all of the the damage and the injuries. It wasn't the actual impact. It was the boom that um, 
people rush to the windows, which is your natural reaction. Like you see a big street uh, of light across the sky, you're going to run to your window to look at it. But of course, if it creates a sonic boom, well, your window may smash. And apparently that's where all of the injuries came from was smashed glass um, uh, hitting people because that's your natural reaction is to run to the window to look at it. So it's kind of scary uh, to, to think about. Um, so, yeah, and that goes to show that like sonic booms are really just shock waves traveling through uh, space. And the sonic booms happen when you have some sort of object that travels through the air faster than the speed of sound. So it's actually faster and um, that's why when you see a sonic or hear a sonic boom, there's definitely a delay that happens as the sound travels towards you. So if there was a meteor that was big enough and traveled faster than 343 meters per second, that's the speed of sound, then we would be able to hear something. But uh, <laughs> they're traveling a little bit slower than that. <laughs> right. Um, let's uh, move on. We've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, probably the most important question of the night comes from uh, Livy, who's age uh, four. Uh, they want to know what kind of dinosaur was that in the dino video that you showed? Uh, hi, Libby. Uh, my expertise is limited to astronomy and physics. I'm not quite an expert quite yet um, <laughs> on different types of dinosaurs, but I can tell you that it's a dinosaur that looks kind of like a velociraptor. That's the extent of my knowledge. Sorry, Libby. <laughs> you know, I did hear, I have uh, actually listened to a few talks about sort of that event that they, um, uh, I always pronounce it wrong. The one that hit Mexico, Ch Ch Chicxulub. Is that how you say it? Chicxulub? I think so, yeah. So obviously the dinosaurs that lived in that part of the world, they would have like uh, been vaporized almost almost immediately, but there would have been uh, life elsewhere in the world that would have eventually died off, but not immediately because there would have ba basically created sort of what we call a nuclear winter where all of the dust would sort of like go up into our atmosphere and the weather would change, uh, the breathing conditions would change, uh, vegetation would die, animals would sort of die off that way. So so um, that extinction event uh, wasn't entirely just a result of the impact, but also of the resulting changing um, uh, planet that, you know, the, the, the atmosphere that we had. And then eventually it was, so the larger ones, the ones that flew off in your animation, those are probably the ones that went first because they obviously need lots of nutrients. Uh, it was the smaller ones and obviously they went next, but then not everything died. There was something still obviously still alive on our planet um, that kind of regenerated again. It's a really fascinating uh, story that I've learned from uh, some of my uh, dinosaur scientist friends. <laughs> it's interesting that you brought up the idea of a nuclear winter because I was watching a TED talk on someone who is uh, has much more expertise on asteroids than I do. And he was talking about the fact that the energy delivered by this impact, by this asteroid hitting our Earth was much stronger than what you would get if you took all the thermonuclear weapons from the height of the Cold War and detonated them all at the same time. So it's an unimaginable amount essentially it's just an enormous amount of energy delivered all at once um, to mm -hmm. these poor dinosaurs so they had kind of a bad day <laughs> yeah and this you know i guess brings us into another subject matter which is how do we mitigate you know um some of these some of these issues and um some of the telescopes that we're building uh, are looking for these asteroids and uh, figuring out solutions for them so hopefully we don't have to have you know um those types of, uh, we don't have to make those decisions, uh, essentially. We can we can deal with them uh, long ahead of time before they come anywhere near the earth. But that, that's for another subject matter. It's a whole other uh, whole other topic in, in itself. Uh, let's get back to the, uh, the questions. Uh, back to Mike who asks, can we measure the components of the comet by looking at the light given uh, by meteors? Okay, so yeah, Ooh. so they're talking about the, I guess, the composition, the light spectrum uh, given off mm -hmm. by the meteor as it coming across, across the sky. Yeah. Is there anything that we can learn from the comet just by looking at that? Mm. Okay, so the idea behind using light as something that gives us an idea of what something is made out of is called spectroscopy. And a spectrometer that gives you the light spectra is essentially like a very fancy prism. And each element has a specific chemical fingerprint or a specific spectra that's assigned to it. And um, by looking at light and looking at kind of where the dark bands are in this chemical fingerprint, we can figure out what elements are there. And so with the case of meteors, it's a little 
bit harder for that because the light given off is light from that friction when you're going through the atmosphere. So it's not quite light from the object itself. It's from right. that process of burning. So if we wanted to uh, look at what the, uh, the constituents of a comet were, we talked a little bit about Rosetta, that mission that actually landed on a comet and was mm -hmm. able to sample and take in-situ measurements on the comet. And that was really useful because, you know, that gave us an insight into what kind of compounds, what kind of elements were around during the formation of our solar system. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, let's move on to Harry. Is there an idea? Oh, if there's an idea of, of mine, uh, hold on, let me read this again. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So I think Harry's talking about um, uh, asteroid mining. So is there an industry potentially about sourcing value from comets. So kind of doing the same thing with comets, like comet mining, I suppose. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, we, I guess the question would be, would we want to do that? Yes, yeah, so I would speculate that um, because comets and asteroids are these leftover pieces um, from the same kind of era, that the composition of the two would be pretty, pretty similar. There would be a lot of overlap there. And comets are traveling incredibly fast. So we would have to have a spacecraft that was able to keep up with the comet, <laughs> mine it, and then come back. So yeah. asteroids are a little bit slower moving and they stick in their asteroid belts and are a little bit easier for us to mine in the future. Right. Yeah, and of course, like the Rosetta mission, like it was such an incredible task uh, just to just to get out there and to land on the comic when moving so fast. One of the most incredible missions uh, that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Um, uh, oh, great. We actually got an answer uh, about the dinosaurs. Uh, so Mike uh, chimed in uh, theropods, apparently, or were those dinosaurs that from that little animation. Good to know. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean that they were the ones that, that died off, but just the ones <laughs> from your from your cartoon. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, uh, Rachel, we are uh, almost at the end, and uh, we are going to be uh, moving on. Of course, you had actually mentioned about uh, light pollution, and for everyone that uh, joined uh, me uh, last week, we actually uh, missed uh, the chance to uh, to talk with uh, Robert Dick about uh, light pollution, but I did eventually interview him. Uh, uh, he was supposed to join live. It didn't work out. I uh, apologize for that. But I did interview him and uh, we aired that on our live stream, which we are going to have up on our YouTube page. So check out the live stream from last night, uh, which will be up on our YouTube page. And uh, um, after a couple presentations from Jonathan and uh, from you as well, uh, Rachel, um, you were in two places at once last night. I was. <laughs> um, there's that interview with Robert Dick. We really get into light pollution and there's some really fascinating uh, studies around it. It's not all about, you know, astronomers bemoaning losing their stars. It actually has a lot to do with the biology and actually the health uh, of our bodies. And we also talked about uh, Beaver Lake, which is in Stanley Park and Beaver Lake uh, have um, worked on their outdoor lighting scheme uh, so that that area is a really great spot to go stargazing and they have applied to become an urban star park. Uh, there's only a couple of those destinations in Canada. Uh, the closest one to us was there's a couple, uh, there's a night sky, there's a dark sky preserve that's out in McDonald Park. So I always say that that's uh, classically the best spot to go do your stargazing, probably a great spot to go uh, pursuit hunting. There's also an urban star park just outside of Victoria uh, as well. Um, I think Prospect, uh, not Prospect Point, um, one of the, the, the parks that's close to by uh, Victoria is also an urban star park. So uh, Beaver Lake, uh, if anyone lives uh, in like the West End downtown area, go check out that area. Uh, they've just redone some of the outdoor lighting schemes. Should be a great place to go stargazing. And uh, we are going to be back uh, next week, next Thursday. Thursday, uh, what, uh, what do we got going on next week? Some gassy giants going on. <laughs> uh, gassy giants, that's right. So on, actually on Wednesday night, uh, today we are going to be putting out information for our next Cosmic Night. Uh, if any of you out there have been to our evening uh, events, uh, we will be in Zoom. Uh, you get a chance to uh, ask uh, live questions. We've got some amazing guests. We've got Dr. Sean Brooks, uh, who is from uh, JPL, uh, working out of Pasadena. Uh, he works uh, is working on the Juno mission and the upcoming 
Europa Clipper mission. Super exciting to talk with uh, Dr. Brooks. And also a bonus interview. I'm actually going to be interviewing him uh, in about an hour. Um, Kevin Gill, who is a citizen scientist. And uh, he, well, he actually does work for JPL, but he's a software engineer. But he works on the Juno images. So Juno uh, is the spacecraft that orbits around Jupiter. And they release all of the images, just like uh, the raw data, and they let anyone uh, take them and process them. And he does a lot of work, a lot of really amazing stuff. And I just found out one of our murals uh, in our gallery space, <laughs> he actually did some processing on. So uh, check that out. We're going to be uh, releasing that information. That's next Wednesday night. And then, of course, next Thursday. We'll be back here to uh, recap, sort of like answer any of the questions left over from our event at 2 p.m. Uh, right here on YouTube. Um, so for me, thanks so much for uh, checking us out. Uh, of course, as always, uh, if you have... Uh, if you have any money to spare, like to donate to us, uh, you can go on to our website and click on donate now. See you next time, everyone.